One of the things I find most interesting when two explorers get together is we sort of trade stories. This is Life's Tough, but explorers are tougher. I'm your host, Richard Weiss. I love the outdoors. I always have, and I always will. I've heard stories that would make the hair on the back of your neck stand up. Explorers are the type of people who walk in space, go to the bottom of the ocean, and stand on the highest summits. Scratch the surface of any explorer, and you'll find they're all storytellers. This show is about their tales. This episode is brought to you by the Podcast Services Division at Life's Tough Media. Having your own podcast allows you to creatively reach all types of audiences, from clients to prospects, to your most loyal membership base. And by utilizing studio affiliates located around the world, coupled with quality remote recording capabilities, Life's Tough Media makes having a corporate podcast easier than ever before. Contact us for a no-obligation consultation at info at lifestuff.com or visit lifestuff.com to learn more. Our guest today is planetary scientist and hopefully soon to be astronaut, Dr. Alan Stern. Many might recall New Year's Eve or day, depending on where you were in the world in 2019, when the New Horizon spacecraft, which Alan was the project director, encountered Ultima Thule, the furthest object ever explored by a spacecraft or humans. As one headline put it, Alan Stern is the scientist that brought Pluto down to Earth Alan, welcome to Life's Tough, Explorers Are Tougher. Thank you, Richard. It's great to be here. Thank yeah, you. and I noticed uh, over your shoulder, you do have, uh, you're, you're in your office in Boulder, Colorado, and I, and I do see your uh, New Horizons spacecraft uh, sitting there on your desk. Just for you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm... Over my other shoulder, where that model of the New Horizons launch vehicle is in the corner, that's an Atlas V back there. You know, so before we get on to that, uh, you know, just before we came on air, uh, today, just as a uh, marking a place in time, uh, the astronaut, Apollo 11 astronaut, Michael Collins, passed away. Um, I had spent three days with him in 2019 at a, uh, in New York, mm -hmm. and I know that uh, you had introduced him to your wife. And, in, and I would think that um, at the time of the Apollo 11 uh, moonwalk, you would have been like the perfect age as a kid to really remember this and, and soak it in. Well, I was, and uh, I think I was uh, 10 years old, and uh, it made a huge impression on me what was going on, and it really is how I got hooked on wanting to be a scientist and part of space exploration. You know, it's funny. I remember that um, not all the launches or uh, aspects of the mission went to perfect school timing, and I, I consciously remember faking being sick so I could sneak in a view on the TV or put the radio to my ear. And I used to, you know, cut out the newspaper uh, clippings. I did all the same stuff. And I had, uh, I had a camera and I'd take photographs of the moonwalks, you know, photographs of the television set, things like that. I think there were a lot of kids that sat on the floor of the den in front of the old 60s color TV and did that. Yeah, and you know, even uh, just a few years further back, I remember in um, '68 when they went around the, the moon for uh, Apollo 8. Uh, I had a Sears telescope I got for uh, Christmas, and I remember, uh, you know, it was again winter, so the skies were a little clear, and I used to stare through that thing, and I thought, if I just look hard enough, I'm going to see, you know, just something from them. How did it work? You know, it, it really brings another subject. If you want to see something bad enough, and this goes into mythology or observational bias, you will see it. Sure, talk to a, talk to a UFO crowd. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, let's talk a little about your childhood. You were born in New Orleans, and then I think at some point you moved to um, Dallas, Texas. You went to the same high school as Victor Vescovo, though a few years apart. And so, you know, were you interested in space and science at that point? I totally was. Um, somewhere around age seven, um, I decided that's what I wanted to grow up and do. 
and my parents kept expecting me to grow out of it, and I never did. And uh, uh, by the time I went to high school in Dallas, um, I, I was completely convinced I would be an engineer or a scientist. I just didn't know which. And uh, I pretty much paid attention in the courses that I liked, which were science, uh, and then uh, really didn't care at all about the English classes and history classes, um, uh, very much to my regret now. You know, I, I feel the same way. I was um, a science major in, at Brown University, and I was like, eh, do I really need to type? Do I really have to know, you know, English? This is all sort of different stuff. And I have to admit, I, I, I do regret not having spent more time, you know, just writing English and, and, and trying to perfect that, that now that I have kids that are 11 and 12 and soon to be 13, that I'm actually paying attention to their English classes. And um, regrettably at this point, I'm actually learning something. Well, I often tell um, uh, students that I mentor that, uh, that to my great surprise, as I went through my scientific career, what I learned is, is that the, the communication skills, both written and, and, and speaking skills uh, became just as important as scientific and engineering acumen. And I wished I paid more attention. I had to learn it um, on the job. But so much of what we do is writing proposals, writing scientific papers, communicating with the public, standing in front of your colleagues and giving a coherent presentation. Uh, I just didn't realize any of that, in part because I had no role models uh, in my family or my parents' close circle of friends who were scientists or researchers. Because I don't think it's different now. I think that I just didn't understand it takes more than just math, physics, chemistry. Yeah, but I think at one point you learn maybe the greatest skill that you need in governmental departments or in life in general is being a salesman. And I know that um, one summer you were a traveling, what, encyclopedia salesman. I did that between my freshman and sophomore years and was good at it and learned a lot um, about life, actually, and about um, hard work uh, and, and, and about sales in a very practical way. And a lot of what we do in big science is you have to sell things. If you're going to fly a billion dollar mission across the solar system, you have to sell that concept and then you have to compete to win it. And I found that throughout my career, uh, I, a lot what we were doing as a team was selling something. And so at, uh, in your journey to become a space scientist, to be an astronaut, you took a little break along the way. I think in college, uh, you took, uh, I guess, what's called a gap year or two. Uh, what, did, what did you do during that time? Well, I had um, pretty much flunked out of my freshman year. Um, the school that you described that I went to as a high school um, was a very small, pretty cloistered uh, boys' school. And then I went to a big state university, University of Texas in Austin, mainly because they had such amazing facilities in physics and astronomy. But suddenly I was immersed in a student body of 40,000 people, half of whom were the other gender. And I didn't pay enough attention to my classes. I was just intoxicated by that freedom. And then I was out of school, to which my parents said, um, no longer our problem, get a job. Wow, um, that's got to be a real kick in the butt because, again, you know, when you ask other explorers or scientists to describe Alan Stern, the word smart always works its way in there. And here's Alan Stern at 18 or 19 flunking out of school, not getting a PhD or not getting A's, but not flunking out because I couldn't do it. It was flunking out because I didn't apply myself. And uh, so I got a job. Um, I got a job on a loading dock. It was the only job that I could get, which is a high school degree you know, loading tires on trucks till my guns got to be crazy big. <laughs> uh, and, but I couldn't make ends meet on minimum wage, you know, a couple of bucks an hour. So I got a second job cutting fried chickens in a fried chicken joint. And I still couldn't make ends meet. And this is coming to a conclusion uh, that you'll like. But uh, I got a third job in a profession that no longer exists. They used to pay kids to go to college classes and take notes for the kids that were absent. And then you'd type them up and turn them in and kids would buy those notes. And because I had to pay attention for a change, I actually thought to myself, these classes aren't that hard. What was I thinking? I can't do this loading dock thing for 40 years and cutting fried chickens. I should go back and actually try. 
which I did. And then from there on out, it worked out. So this was at the expense of your guns, which was probably good for your original goal of getting girls back when you were a freshman in college. But that's got to be your, uh, so how did you, you know, sort of redress that um, going back to school with your parents, going back to your school? Well, you they, know? Had said, they had said to me, if at any point you want to go back to school, you get a second shot, as long as you're not over 25. You know, that that, that, that is a great, but Alan, you have to understand that most people who see you now, see you on TV, very confident, very, gr really great science communicator. It's hard to imagine you not applying yourself because it seems like in every project, and you've done a lot of projects, it seems that um, you very much apply yourself. Uh, well, that was then, this is now. Um, I think the practical uh, lesson of being out of school for a year, having to have three jobs, all of them at the bottom of the ladder without much um, uh, chance for career advancement. I mean, what are you gonna do? Cut fried chickens at a bigger joint? Um, and so, you know, and so how is me that I, I really didn't bear down if I wanted my space career. And so let's go to your space career. So um, you do well in the rest of college. And then, you know, by the, I think, end of the 80s, you're working on space projects, right? What was your first big project you worked on? Well, the first thing, I mean, I worked on some things that were in the classified world. And um, I really wanted to get closer uh, I wanted to move, move towards more hardware type engineering. And I took a job with a big scientific laboratory that was doing a lot of space science here in Colorado and, um, and was in charge of some suborbital sounding rockets. And then the next thing I was promoted to be the project scientist, the scientist who was day to day in charge of a satellite to be launched on the space shuttle. I mean, that had to be exciting. It was super exciting right up to the day that the Space Shuttle Challenger exploded in front of my eyes with that satellite aboard and uh, turned it into a million smithereens and of course killed the crew and, and, uh, and uh, dashed the projected career that I thought I was on. And your, your career, you were hoping to be an astronaut at that point. Well, I was, and, uh, uh, but uh, I was trained as an engineer. I took an undergraduate degree in physics. Then I went out and got a couple of master's degrees in engineering. And I thought that um, I would be an engineer for the rest of my life. But as I was doing these science missions, I found myself more and more attracted to the scientific side. But I was a young guy with a, a wife and a kid and a house and a mortgage. And I couldn't figure out how I could go back and get a PhD and the union card to be a scientist. And then when the shuttle Challenger exploded, the entire space program you know, went to halt for three years. And um, I took advantage of that to to um, apply to graduate schools. And that was in January of 86. By September, I was taking classes um, to get a PhD in astrophysics, which set me on the course, you know, to being a, a scientist and principal investigator. So you're, you know, again, uh, I think as people know you and maybe people get uh, typecast a bit, you're, you're sort of typecast for Ultima Thule, which by the way, uh, I was speaking to a mutual friend of ours just before this interview, uh, Richard Garriott, and um, who was the uh, founder of the game Ultima. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, it was Ultima was his game. And he said that, um, tell Alan, why did he actually change the name of that object uh, that they went to? So that's, that's a question which we've never done on this show, actually brought in a question from somebody else. Oh, well, we changed it um, for the original reason. Um, we, we just uh, chose Ultima Thule as a placeholder. And we said that in the beginning, is that once we saw what it looked like, we would choose a real name. And so after the flyby, we got a real name. It's Arakoth, which is a uh, Native American word for the sky. So when you do deep space, I think that um, the public, and, and again, uh, you know, part of what you do is communicating what you are doing to a, uh, a broader uh, um, pub, broader audience, the public, that when these rockets are launched and you hear the people say, oh, they'll be reaching their target in 10 years or, or some sort of time like that, that sounds like really long-term planning. And so are you sort of concurrently 
planning several missions, sending some off, or or I, I can't imagine they need babysitting every day. Well, uh, actually, so there's two stories there. First, everybody I know in the space science business um, works on many missions at once. Doesn't mean every day you work on many, but uh, I've worked on 29 missions that have flown or are about to launch in the next couple of years now. You know, and so if I did them serially, one at a time, I would have to be 300 years old. So you're working on many projects in parallel. But in addition, um, New Horizons, um, let me contrast it to Voyager, which I think everybody knows about Voyager, the storied mission that made the first explorations of the uh, four giant planets. And, and Voyager had a ground crew, think of it as the, the team, of 450 people. Wow, that sounds like and a lot. It's a lot. And New Horizons was like 50 belly buttons to do the same job. Um, so the 50 of us, that's one tenth as many, were crazy busy the entire 10 years doing the work of 450 people from a project in the 1980s. Now we had better automation and we had computers that helped us and we have lots of tools like video conferencing even then in the early 2000s that helped. But um, I guarantee you, we were busy the entire 10 years, all of us. You know, it's, it's really an incredible story because there's a handful of times outside of the moon mission and certain disasters that you felt that citizen science was going on around the world. You know, most recently, I recall the, the solar eclipse. I, I, I really felt that that was a, a time in which everybody I knew was standing outside and at least talking about it. But it's unusual that people would talk about an object that, you know, kind of an odd shaped object, but it really brought up conversations. Were you surprised at sort of the, the media attention that this got? I was surprised both with the Pluto flyby and with the Ultima Thule now Erika flyby, um, how much they impacted um, uh, the culture and how, how intensively they were covered um, uh, by media of all stripes. Uh, and, but very pleased about that because, um, you know, I think the most important spin-off or derivative benefit, if you will, of space exploration is that it's, a, it's kind of a gateway drug to STEM careers. And as much as uh, a lot of little kids like dinosaurs as much as they like space, in the end, the dinosaurs always lose uh, to space. And it's, it's a very rare individual that goes into a, a career like Ken Lacavera. My friend, and your friend, I was I was smiling, thinking that that's exactly who you were talking about. But, but the number of space people way outnumbers the number of people in, in that his field. Um, I think just because more people gravitate to it. But the great thing, and this is true all the way back to the Apollo days, is that for every one person that goes into an actual space career, hundreds, maybe thousands. I don't have a hard number, but there's a huge gear ratio of people that just go into engineering and science and fuel the economy um, through inventing things and uh, changing the way the world is for everything from the internet uh, uh, to the PC revolution to every other kind of technology. When you talk to people in those engineering fields, they often got hooked on it and they put up with all the hard math and homework assignments um, because way back they were interested in space exploration and that eventually led them to do something else good for the world. Now, I'm sure that you've discussed with your colleagues because let's face it, having a um, widely watched event is very helpful in planning other events. One sort of successful project begets others. Have you sort of analyzed what it was about Ultimate Thule or, or, the, or the New Horizons that sparked people's imagination? Well, I think it was a combination of things, to be honest. Um, one was we put together a very good plan. And we held some workshops. Uh, I remember the first one was in uh, Manhattan in December of 2013, about 18 months before we got to Pluto. We brought in all these crazy people from the advertising and media world and uh, put them in a, in a room for three days. And the most important lesson that came out of that was there's not a single thing you can do uh, that will bring a large audience. You need to do a whole salvo of different things because different things appeal to different people. And that applies both in the, the, the types of media that we use, but also the themes that we talked about. Some people were interested in the science, but by no means most of them. Some were interested in the exploration. 
Some are interested in the people stories. Some were interested in just the risk of it all, that you had one shot, one spacecraft, it's gonna work or it doesn't, the drama. And there were other themes as well. And, uh, and that was the right approach, was to go after all of them. And as a result, uh, it had this huge tidal wave that NASA hadn't seen since Apollo in terms of uh, eyeballs you know, on something NASA was doing. You know, I guess if I, if I thought about it, and, and again, you saved my New Year's Eve. I, I hate that holiday for the reasons that people suddenly think at the stroke of midnight, something's gonna change and it never really does. But uh, I enjoyed watching that. And I guess what attracted me is because you're always wondering what's over the next hill. And, and I think that um, probably for you, especially for Pluto, there's so many things that you gleam from just a couple images. And, and you mentioned some of the instruments that you use that I, I think that was what at least attracted me. I was curious to what they were gonna find. That's because you're an explorer at heart. That's the meme that attracted you. Why am I not surprised? <laughs> I'm president of the Explorers Club and, and an explorer of our earth. Um, but I'll tell you a story related to media and the ultimate tool we fly by um, on, uh, on January 1st, 2019. Uh, when we targeted the flyby, we did it mathematically to minimize the amount of fuel that it took so we could afford the fuel for doing things after that. And it, it just turned out when you did the math that we were going to make closest approach 33 minutes after midnight, 33 minutes into the new year. And after, after a couple of months of tracking the spacecraft and tracking the target, um, one of the engineers, the mission design folks said, we need to do a course correction and while we're at it if, it, if it's better, if it's easier to just round that off, three minutes makes no difference. I can make it right at the half hour. That's incredible. Would you like to do that? And I said, no way. And he said, what, you came back so quickly, why? I said, well, I've taken all these courses in media. And right at the bottom of the hour, every network is going to commercial break. By 33 minutes, they'll all be back. I want to be you know, inspiring people with what NASA can do. You know, it's funny. My thought was, how did they do it? I thought, how could you plan that many years back? And and things have to happen so perfectly. So that, that's a this is a moment of discovery for me that that this is slightly by accident and then by uh, design. Yeah, well, I think it, the real key is you know really talented, motivated team because all space flight is a team sport. Um, but when you get right down to it. Um, you find that there are a lot of tricks of the trade and, uh, and things like this round off are an example of that. That's great. Now, I, I want to talk about paradigms and I keep going back to our childhoods. You know, the paradigm I remember in, in elementary school was that there were nine planets, life existed, you know, above freezing, below boiling, and that, you know, the bottom of the ocean was lifeless. And, you know, science goes on and obviously those paradigms have sort of uh, gone by the wayside, especially when it talks about nine planets. Do you ever kind of feel like, gosh, I wish I was going to be around in 100 or 200 years to see what they're going to see next? I, I almost feel like planetary science is, or, or, or space science is so awesomely large that uh, there's that feeling of, gosh, I'm not going to be around for when they do something. Richard, that's precisely how I feel every day. Um, I'm rooting for the biologists in life extension. Um, it's such an interesting story. Um, and it's, of course, it's a never ending story. You know, we're on our way, it may take centuries, but we're on our way to a Star Trek future. And I would love to be a part of that for uh, more generations um, than we normally get a chance to do. Um, but like I said, we have to root on the biologists for that. You know, vir virtually every space person I speak to or know at some point brings up Star Trek. And, you know, considering, you know, it was panned by critics uh, when it first came out. And I think the first episode, was, was, it, was it the Trouble with Tribbles or Captain Pike or one of those? But it's been so influential, at least in the mindset of people. Yeah. And of course, over the decades now, the franchise has, you know, woven a really interesting tapestry of television shows taking place at various points in time along the story arc of the whole Star Trek universe, and then the motion pictures as well. Um, but it's affected people from, uh, I think, 
deeply affected people born everywhere from really early in the century, in the late 1930s, all the way up to uh, kids born in the 21st century. So Alan, we ha have only a couple minutes left. And so I'm going to ask you sort of the Alan Stern magic wand. I know you want to go into space and, and this looks like it's going to happen. Is that the next big thing for you? Or, or is there a whole bucket list full of a lot of things? Uh, there's a bucket list, but I would put that as my number one priority is uh, not just flying in space, which I'll be doing hopefully next year and then afterwards, but flying in space a lot. Uh, and because of the, uh, the revolution in commercial space flight uh, and the pivot of the whole industry in that direction, it's becoming possible as a researcher to expect to go to work, to go to space, not to be a tourist, but to be a worker. Uh, and uh, that's my life's dream professionally. And uh, I'm very fortunate that NASA selected me to do this uh, just last year. That's exciting. Do you ever reflect upon the 10 year old Alan Stern who was watching Apollo 11 to think that, you know, back then it, it just had to seem so fantastical that, or even the guy who was working at, working at the loading dock, you know, if you would have told Alan Stern, who's, you know, picking up crates of chickens at the loading dock that he would someday fly into space, what would you have said to that Alan Stern? Well, I don't know, but I, you know, it, it's, it's very difficult to say because at that time, there were motion pictures like 2001, A Space Odyssey, that suggested by the time that uh, the turn of the century came, that space flight would be routine and that would be a normal part of a career. And we were stymied for decades. We're now going a lot faster again. But I thought this would all happen at a much earlier point in my career, not 50 years after I was 10 years old. Yeah, and, and you know, thank goodness the requirements for being an astronaut, I think, uh, Back when Michael Collins and Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, they had, you know, such a crazy, rigorous set of standards that it was so difficult for, I mean, you, you just marvel at what those guys had to go through. Unbelievable. And, and now we know unnecessarily in the sense that it's not that rigorous. I mean, yes, you have to you know, be able to pull G's and you have to be able to do other things, but uh, the average person can do that if they're reasonably fit. It doesn't take a superhuman. Um, and nor does it take everybody who's on the space flight to be up in the cockpit being the pilot. Um, there are many other applications now. Uh, most of what astronauts do in the American space program today is conduct experiments on the space station or maintain it. So they're, they're big on repair and research. And out of a six month mission, which is typical, they only spend a few hours really getting there and coming back and being pilots. Uh, so it's really, the game has changed a lot. You know, I, I know a few people now at this point who are slated at some point to go into space, but I have to admit, you know, I, I do know you and I know your research and I, I, I am so thankful that I can just imagine Alan Stern sitting above the earth, being able to look up at the sky and look down at the planet. The only thing I fear for you is that you'll never go to sleep. You'll, you'll think you're missing something. Well, that might be, but on a suborbital flight, it's pretty brief, so there's probably very little. Well, that's the sub. I'm thinking further down the road, Alan. Come on, I know you're going to get up in, into those other things at some point. We're working on that. Yeah, that, that would be really something to be able to fly orbital missions or even to do planetary science on the moon. Well, I, I wish you luck and, and thank you again for inspiring so many people with what you do. It's, it's been a bit of a, a journey, but um, you know, with persistence and smarts and 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 so many other things involved, you, you've really set an example for so many people. So thank you very much for being on Life's Tough, Explorers Are Tougher. Thank you, Richard. It's been an honor.